Well, Lynn Thorne, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this conversation. Can you tell us what's your job and, and what do you basically do? My name is Lynn Thorne. I'm an Aboriginal health practitioner in the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And uh, my job is actually to be with our patients because they come from a, a, a vast area of Australia, um, mainly like uh, up in the Northern Territory. Uh, they come down without any family. Um, and I just, uh, I'm there to um, be their advocate, um, to be a friend, um, we do have younger ones, so I'm also like an auntie. Um, and yeah, so I take on all different roles, but to deliver the same thing and just to make sure that, um, you know, they, they are comfortable in and knowing knowledge of what's happening to them, um, yeah, without fear. And why is it important to have Aboriginal staff, Torres Strait Islander staff working with patients and families. Why does that make a difference in terms of the results in health? I think there's always that fear um, and it goes in history that um, if Aboriginal people go to hospital, they're never going to come out. So it's, and, and it's really good to have an Aboriginal person there because um, we relate to them a lot better. Um, you know, we understand some of us have got, um, you know, the language, uh, you know, like we can understand them. So there's those barriers that we can work with. Um, but more to the point that, you know, they feel safe having, having their own people around. Lynn, you're an auntie. What does that mean and how does that help the patients and families you're with? Okay, so I'm actually 65 um, and I guess at this stage of my life um, I can be called like auntie or nana or, or sister or whatever. So in Aboriginal culture we take on different roles and um, people will automatically look at you. If they're younger they'll call me auntie or nan. Um, so sometimes I have to use the auntie way of speaking to my patients or being a nana just to comfort them, to make them, uh, you know, feel that they are um, you're looked after by a family member. Um, so I guess that's where I um, fit in as an auntie or a nana. You know, I've come to the Royal Adelaide Hospital and I've seen... Uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander unit. And, you know, you come in the front door of the hospital and even before you go into the main hospital, you turn to the left and there's a completely separate unit with a great big lounge room. You walk in and there's a wall with all Aboriginal faces on it and your names. There's a garden you can have, a, uh, an outdoor area, a barbecue. Uh, and there's a lot of Aboriginal staff how does that help people to keep coming each day to accept their treatment and to give them a better chance of survival? I guess that's that's also a add-on to the cultural safety thing, you know, about actually having a place where they can sit and, you know, um, just get help. Um, and basically, you know, like if I was a patient walking in and I knew that was there, I'd be going, oh, you know, I feel good now. You know, I feel good that there's there's a place where I can go, um, that I, you know, a lot of people don't want to face other people, so they've got that space to feel comfortable. So that also helps in the healing process, having someone always there to talk to or whatever, because it's a lot of people have come down to Adelaide and they've never been to Adelaide. Adelaide or a big city. So it's about, you know, making sure that their spirit is, is um, safe. As I mentioned to you before, I've had cancer myself and I had radiation and chemo and I had to turn up every day for radiation 30 days in a row. How do you help people to keep coming every day? Are you able to help with things like transport or accommodation when people have come from a long way away? Yes, um, that's a part of our, what we do is that when uh, 
when patients are coming down, we already know they're coming down. Um, and so we get, we work with PATS, patients assistants, and they organise uh, them to go into, um, um, into hostels. And we have what we call um, a corporate shuttle, which is used for transport. So they get them in and out on there uh, for their appointments. You, you mentioned that you can speak to people. Do you ever use interpreters? You know, because there's so many different Aboriginal languages, aren't there, spoken all around where you are and up north to the end Northern Territory? Well, we're very lucky because we have what um, the service called ABC uh, interpreters, and we have Aboriginal interpreters that speak a number of languages. So we're very lucky. You know traditional healers, th that word, is it Nung Curry? I might be saying it incorrectly. Nung Curries. Nung Curries. Does that yes. come into your, into your role there? It does. Um, and we're very fortunate that uh, we've got the Nung Curry service and that, that uh, they get treated and it's all under Medicare, which is fantastic. I didn't know that. Can you explain what a nunkery is and why that would really help your people to feel more at home and more safe when they're getting their cancer treatment? I think with traditional Aboriginal people, they always used the healers, you know, when they were all in their communities, and they probably still do. Um, to have it here in Adelaide is like, you know, that's a part of their healing. As soon as you mention like nunkeries, they um, they yeah you know bring them in, um, you know, and the nunkeries are really good. I've actually used them myself um, at certain times, um, and I believe um, you know they're a good part of the healing journey. When I came to visit the unit uh, in Adelaide, uh, I was shown that there were, you've got uh, some different clothing. There's like an area where you've got clothing. Can you explain why you provide clothing for some people if they want it? You've got to think like Northern Territory is quite warm, um, you know, and they, when they get here, they come down and just whatever they get on the plane with. And when they get here, they get cold. So we've always got that. But we also have patients that don't have very much and they can just go in and help themselves. Um, it's just about providing stuff that they need. Thank you so much for talking to us and what a credit to them back in WA because it inspired you to do all the wonderful work you're doing now. It was absolutely wonderful to speak to you. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Well, it's my great pleasure now to welcome Denise uh, to discuss what's happening at the Royal Adelaide Hospital to try and close the gap in the cancer results for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Can you introduce yourself, Denise, and tell us what your job is? Yes, I can. Well, Nina Mani first, which is greetings in Ghana language, because I am sitting on Ghana land. Um, so that's a little way I acknowledge the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. Uh, my name is Denise Carpeny and I'm the Strategic Project Officer for the Central Adelaide Local Health Network. A huge part of my role um, is looking at the, the strategic policies and plans and the Aboriginal health plan uh, for, this, for Carlin, um, specifically Aboriginal focus policies and strategic plans. Um, while my role is not a huge lot of patient contact, but with a short small team that we have, I do often um, have a lot of patient contact. And I should uh, acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people uh, in Sydney and to pay my respects uh, to Elders past and present. So thank you for that reminder uh, of what I should have done right at the start. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I always do that uh, all the time, even when I answer the phone. And so that's another little education because I'll answer Nina Mani, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and Wellbeing Hub, and people make the assumption that my name is Nina. So I give them a little bit of an education session there. So we'll know it's Ghana language and I'm greeting you. People who are watching this are interested in what they can do to help close the gap when it comes to cancer and Aboriginal people. 
What are you doing there? We've heard quite a bit about it, but what do you think you're doing there that shows how to help close the gap? What are the the main things you're doing and that more people need to do across Australia? Well, one of the, one of the first uh, uh, things that we just finished working on um, is the identification project, um, which specifically means um, a lot of Aboriginal people are not identified when they come into the hospital. And so if they're not identified, they're not put on our list. And so they don't get the support and services that they, you know, that we could offer them while they're there, unless we find them ourselves or uh, other family members. Now that I, I've played a huge role in um, that campaign. It's part of the national campaign, asking the question, uh, and it's basically uh, collecting more accurate data um, for the hospital, but also accurate data for us in regards to just identification um, plays a huge role on what we can do to put in activities and things and programs to work towards closing the gap together. But I will say that we can't do it on our own. We've got to work together with Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And closing the gap, not just on cancer, but on all health aspects and um, life expectancy as well. And that uh, educational role with non-Aboriginal health staff, what, what needs to happen? In your experience, what is effective in really making people not just aware, but motivated to learn more and help make a difference? I believe uh, that it needs to be compulsory within the health system. Uh, other places it is compulsory, compulsory to have cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, cultural safety or security, whichever term you want to use. And currently that's part of my role in providing those sessions for the staff within Carlin. And we've got over 12,000 staff. So on a regular basis, I do smaller sessions as well as bigger sessions um, to provide information, um, but also tips to help people uh, working with Aboriginal people. Uh, it's sad to think that I, in my time working here, um, non-Aboriginal people seem a bit scared and a bit hesitant um, when approaching Aboriginal people or talking to them and trying to get information out. And so that's part of my role. Um, so I've just finished doing some with some new nursing students. And I also do it once a year with year six medical students. So that's before they actually come out of university. Um, and benefit of that this year, they're just asking me to do a second one. So because of the makeup where our patients come from, our catchment area is all of South Australia, all of Northern Territory, Eastern, Western Australia, and Western New South Wales and Victoria. So we'll get Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people coming from those areas as well. So when I do my uh, talks and sessions, it's not totally specific because you can't be because of the makeup of the clientele. Uh, so it's a, a general session, making them aware of the huge number of Aboriginal people across this country. Language is a huge issue. People still believe and think that we only have one language and it's not so. But can you describe for us some um, four or five of the most common language groups who are coming to you, just so people hear the names. Okay, Pitinjara is one of the one of the bigger ones, um, and people would have heard AP Wildlands, that's the Anangul Pitinjara Yankarajara lands, um, and that covers three states and territories, so it's the north uh, of South Australia, part of Western Australia, Northern Territory. Um, so that is the biggest one from South Australia, but we tend to use Aranda, that's the language around Alice Springs, um, Walpri, which is a little bit further out, and all the Yongu language from the top end from Arnhem Land. Um, so, yeah, Aranda, uh, Pinjara, Antigirinya, uh, Walpri, Luritja, they're some of the most common that we uh, need interpreters for. Do you think yeah. that's still something people need to learn and understand, that culture is very much alive and language is alive in a huge um, area of Australia? Yes, I do. Um, plus, I've also, that's a passion of mine. Prior to coming to work for health, I um, worked in an Aboriginal community-based language centre. Um, they were set up all over Australia, and it's about preserving, recording and maintaining 
the languages of South Australia. Um, yeah, I think it's very important. Um, but they're also, uh, people can learn as well, um, uh, the languages if, if they want to. Uh, part of who my family is, I'm a Ngarindiri Naranga Ghana and Nandjamatana woman, so that's salt water, fresh water and rock people. And people can learn those languages as well. So some people might say that our languages are dead and they're not. We call them sleeping and I'll say to people when they say you can't because you've got so many, well yes we can. And if you look at um, the Hebrew language, that was lost for hundreds of years and that was um, revived and retrieved, so we can do it here. Denise, our time is up, but what's going to close the gap and how long is it going to take when it comes to cancer? Wow, that's a huge one. I mean, uh, cancer's hit my family really hard. Um, my mother had both bowel and breast cancer and I lost my older sister to cancer. Um, sadly, out of eight children, there's only me and my younger sister left. And she's also got cancer. She's got three different types. Um, what it's going to do is to... It's, it's, means all of us need to work together, whether we're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, and the health profession need to start really thinking outside the square and start really listening to what people are saying to them and, and what is working. Um, what we're doing now, um, and it's just been established as an Aboriginal community um, reference group, and it's all linked in with the National um, Health and Safety and Quality Standards. And one of them is consumer uh, participation and consumer engagement. So we've just had our second meeting um, and that's people who are consumers, who are the users of the service, people who have been patients, um, so that they're gonna have a huge input into developing our Aboriginal health plan and looking at the plans for cancer and other chronic diseases. But we have to work together and don't always, you know, think outside the box, but getting the health profession to do that is a bigger task than what we think, but we're not giving up and we'll f keep fighting to the end. I want to thank you uh, so much for talking to us. I also want to just say how sorry I am that your family has been so toughly impacted uh, by cancer. And, uh, and how much I respect the work that you're doing uh, with the other Aboriginal staff there and those who support you. Thank you so much for talking to us. You're welcome. Thank you. See ya.